Um, but basically what we do, folks, two, two things. I'm going to speak about um, recreational water in a couple of days. Um, but a lot of our work in, in the past 20, 30 years really has been catchments. I started doing a PhD on catchments um, m m more long ago than I care to remember. Um, but basically catchment management and fecal indicator flux from catchment systems is really coming to the fore um, with research worldwide. Um, in Europe, sorry, um, in Europe it's governed by many of the Water Framework Directive. But really, I'm here because of Havelock, and I'm very grateful to be here again in New Zealand. And what this is really about is um, what can catchment microbial dynamics contribute to the understanding of the Havelock case. I'd like to go in a, you know, 20 minutes um, through to make an assessment of that. Um, what you had with Havelock was these, if you like, markers. And in, in essence, the microbiology, when you read the report from the inquiry, was screaming that there was a risk. Whether it was human disease incidents, whether it was E. coli, um, there was clearly a risk management situation underway in Havelock. And I'd like to just look through now and look at how we might try and manage that kind of situation, drawing on lessons from Europe and drawing on some of the science of catchment management for microbial um, attenuation. In US, and this is, I think, quite interesting data, if you'll bear with me for a moment. Um, it's a bit uh, off-piste, if you like. But in the US, what they do is they have what's called the Clean Water Act. Now, that, if you read it, is exactly the same as the European Water Framework Directive. It sets out the, um, the focus for catchment management to produce water quality objectives. And um, it's interesting when you look at the Water Framework Directive, which was actually written by a, a Scotsman, um, who now is chair of SEPA. And in Europe, it's always called the English Directive, um, uh, which the Scots hate. But basically, <laughs> it was a very simple concept. And the concept was define your water quality objectives, then manage your catchments upstream to achieve the water quality objectives needed for existing and planned uses. It's, it's the science of the shattering the obvious. But why I like what the, WA, uh, what the um, US EPA do every week is they publish data on what are the main reasons for non-compliance, um, impaired waters as part of the work of the Clean Water Act. And you'll see there at the top of that list isn't the nutrients, which we're all very concerned about in the UK and worldwide. The main reason for concern is the pathogens. And the Americans don't mean pathogens, they mean E. coli. And the main, if you like, sources of those pathogens is agriculture. And I want to give you a very simple number to start with. Every sheep produces 10 times more E. coli than a person per day. All the sewage from the people goes through secondary treatment in most of the Western and developed nations. Now, what that means basically, if you do the maths on it, 100 sheep is giving the same catchment loading as a million people because it goes directly onto the catchment systems. So agricultural input before the fecal indicators is generally much more important now than the human sewage which goes through treatment systems. I've assumed there we get three log reduction on secondary treatment, okay? And if you want me to go to the maths later, we can do it over a cup of tea. But what the what Clean Water Act shows us is the main reason for concerning catchment systems is actually the microbial pollution. Um, this is a, a, a real shocker, to be honest, for the regulatory agencies in the UK, because most of our regulatory effort is nitrate-sensitive zones. It's the nutrients. And if you look at the literature, we've got huge literature on nutrients in catchment systems, very, very sparse literature on catchment fecal indicator and pathogen dynamics. The next thing I'd like to say very briefly is that what we're dealing with in microbial terms is extremely episodic pollution. If we think of the fecal indicators, we all excrete them. Um, sheep and cattle, commonly 10 to the 6 per gram, humans similar. Young animals, generally more than older animals, so the fecal loading from young animals is about the same as old animals most of the time. But it's very, very episodic. If you measure a river over a maybe a six to a 12 week period during a bathing season, maybe 95 to 99% of what's coming out is during a few storm events. Now, those few storm events are not extreme events. In New Zealand, I've been here only a couple of days and I've seen quite a few storm events. <laughs> Commonly, during the summer bathing season in, in the United Kingdom, maritime western margins in Europe, we get between one and two, depends where you are, 
but the average is between one and two storm events a week, which produce episodic flux movement down the treatments, down the stream systems into the bathing waters and sheltered hygiene areas. So we're dealing with a very, very episodic pollution. It's even more episodic when you start dealing with the pathogens, whether they're zoonotic, animal-derived, or human, because they only, they're only there when somebody's ill. So things like norovirus generally occurs in certain seasonal periods and is, 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 is there on maybe, in a, an average community in Britain, it's there for a few weeks, um, but it's only being shed for those few week periods. So that's even more episodic. So we we're trying to manage something which is extremely episodic and we're trying to keep the public safe from drinking water sources from that very episodic pollution using the indicators which are episodic and then the pathogens which are even more episodic that we're trying to protect from. So it's a very, very difficult management challenge. The Water Framework Directive requires regulators in Europe to establish a programme of measures at the catchment scale to protect drinking water, both in terms of the abstraction volumes and in terms of the quality of the drinking water abstracted. And it's got to be fit for purpose given the treatment system. So that's what the Water Framework Directive does, and it's very similar to the US Clean Water Act and very similar to catchment legislation now worldwide. But it's a very, very simple concept. And the question is, with practical farming systems, and we have uh, in Wales, I've mentioned the loadings, but we've got about 11 million sheep and 3 million people where I come from, and I, I would imagine the numbers are similar in New Zealand in terms of the loadings. And we've got this huge animal-derived pollution loading, which is important for compliance of anything that's measured in terms of the faecal indicators, but it's certainly also important in terms of the zoonotic infections from sheep. It's not giving as much, obviously, in terms of the human infection from things like norovirus. But what we need to know is what can catchment microbial dynamics do in terms of managing those kind of systems? If you like, how do we make sure the faecal film that we all live in um, and catchment systems it doesn't get into the drinking water supply. And can we do anything on the catchments to reduce it sufficiently by what in agricultural terms are called best management practices to, make, to minimize the risk to humans? And that's what I want to talk about for the next few minutes. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the management practices, don't worry. Um, you know, it would take us too long to go through it, but I'll give you some overall figures and stats on that. In terms of Havelock North, the best comparator I can give you from data on to give you, I think, a nice warm feeling of how well you're doing um, is really what we call small supplies or private water supplies, they're sometimes called throughout the UK. And we've done quite a lot of work on these small private water supplies. They're very similar in size. And interestingly, they're managed by the district council level in terms of the monitoring and measurement of those systems. That's the level in the UK. So I, I can only speak for the UK here in terms of the pressures, but we've probably taken about 25% of the resource away from the district councils. And it's their environmental health officers who are um, graduate and postgraduate professionals who are the proper officers for saying whether a, a private water supply is or is not human, uh, fit for human consumption based on the monitoring that they do. Having said that, given the lack of resource, the vast majority of them are simply not monitored. So in Britain, there's very little data, but I'm gonna show you data from studies which have tried to define the level to which they are acceptable or not. First um, example here, very briefly, was a uh, report by a government scientist fairly recently. And what they did was just to analyze about 34,000 samples from about 11,000 small supplies in the UK. Now to cut to the end point, what they said is 32% of the samples failed with E. coli. And if you adjust for the size of supply, that means that something like 54% of private water supplies in Britain would not pass potable standards for E. coli. That's the current position. Now, if we go through that, I'm not going to go through all those there, but there have been a number of papers on this, and a lot came through um, as we started to grapple with this issue in the late 90s, early, early, early 2000s. But you can get the same result from many, many studies. So there's confirmatory results from many people who've gone out and measured these things. Um, just in terms of what's in them that causes um, the outbreaks, the principal, uh, uh, the principal pathogen probably is a anotic Campylobacter, uh, which rings a resonance at the moment with the, the Havelock case. But Cryptosporidium has been a big issue, but not as much in the private supplies. It's been more in the chlorinated public supplies as a, a big issue in the UK. 
it's been to some extent that one of the biggest issues that the, the large water companies have dealt with in recent years, mainly because of what we call the cryptosporidium regulations that required them to monitor cryptosporidium with a thousand litre sample every day. And the presence of cryptosporidium in the thousand litre sample was taken to be evidence of supplying water unfit for human consumption, which was a criminal case for the water companies involved. So that, that um, concentrated minds greatly for the large water companies in Britain, but in private supplies, it wasn't as big an issue. Let me move through all of the, um, the usual kind of candidate list here, um, but you know, single numbers of supplies, but they were 19 supplies that were all private water supply, sorry, 19 outbreaks, all private water supply related over that time period. Um, we did some data or some measurements a few years ago and tried a risk assessment on a, a number of private supplies that were monitored for an 18 month period during the period of um, foot and mouth disease in the United Kingdom. And what you can see there on the bottom axis, on the, the graph here, is just the best predictor of what was in those private supplies. It was the rainfall in the last three days. And, and that predicted with an explained variance um, of about 35%, um, the level of, on this axis here, E. coli in the private supplies. So you can get some um, prediction of the water quality in these private supplies by just knowing whether it's rained or not. The other important factor is we did risk assessments of all those private supplies and the high risk sites, just splitting them into two groups, against the low risk sites, the more 42 sites in total, um, that gave you a, uh, uh, a statistically significant geometric mean value between the high risk sites and the low risk sites for the level of uh, E. coli in those supplies. So risk assessment there did work to differentiate between what were microbiologically high values and microbiologically low values. And that was um, risk assessment before it was applied across the board in the UK. So I'm going to give you just some idea about what the different um, type of uh, small supply looks like in the United Kingdom. This is the percent supply failure by source. So the, the pink values for wells and 100% of wells failed in the study we did. Um, springs, um, we got failures of over 60%. And then um, boreholes, they were the best, but we still got failures between 30 and 40%. Um, we've seen some deep bores which never showed a fail. It was 80, 80 meter deep bore, well constructed, you know, zero, zero, zero. One of those deep bores which gave that result with zero throughout this 18 month, 18 month study, the uh, farmer paid about 15,000 pounds for the deep bore in uh, Wales about 10 years ago. Um, but the, it tasted so horribly, mixed it with the original private supplier, which was an open string with sheep defecation because that tasted better as a mixture. Um, the microbiology of the mixture was pretty poor. But one caution in the UK, and I hope this isn't the case in New Zealand, springs are not geologists' springs. They're not water which comes through after filtration in rocks and is very, very clean. Springs in the private supply world are generally, in my experience, shallow soil water through flow. So they're impacted particularly by soil drainage and, and, and uh, field drainage in soil. So that's what we have as springs in our private supplies. I hope it's not the case for you folks in, in New Zealand, but that's really unsatisfactory. Um, I'd like to just finish in terms of the, what, what, what the quality is with this piece of work we did for the Drinking Water Inspectorate. And this was done really by Lorna Futrell, and the idea here was to have two six-week monitoring periods of a number of private supplies, which are all large private supplies. Many of these are similar population sizes to Havelock North. Okay, I'll show you what, um, briefly what we've monitored for, and you can see there the, the usual candidates for the pathogens are there as well as the faecal indicators. Okay, And there were seven supplies. I'd just like to take you through these fairly briefly. I can't, because of confidentiality, say where they were, um, but the paper is published. And if anybody would like the paper with those anonymized, you're very welcome to this. And um, you know, a lot of this is backed by papers, so just let me know if you'd like anything sent through. But the first one was a borehole supply um, population supplied about 11,000. Um, there had been a norovirus outbreak, which was in fact why the drinking water inspector put that onto the study. Second was a stream with filtration and UV uh, disinfection. Um, it was a stream which was actually used in, by an um, uh, agricultural um, milk production operation. Um, the third one was a well with filtration and UV disinfection. Uh, the fourth was a reservoir a major reservoir supplying a municipal building that treated people who were ill. Okay, um, now that was a, it was, it was stored um, very carefully 
um, put into service reservoirs after treatment um, and it was uh, used by what were quite vulnerable people. Um, five was a spring-fed spring stream with no treatment. Six was a borehole, uh, filtered and used ozone treatment. And the seventh was a resurgent underground stream supplying a hamlet of about 250 people. Um, this was installed assuming it was a groundwater fed stream with a borehole. Because I've said it was a resurgent stream, what I, what I want to get over there, it was in a karstic region where the streams underground have got very similar quality to the streams overground. What I mean is they're, they're brown when it rains and they have lots of fecal material in them. Three are, um, we've got my uh, box, oh, sorry, three have got my boxes on. Uh, uh, number two, number five and number seven. I'd like to just look at those as we go through. I'm going to give you, flash up the uh, compliance levels for those values as we go through the different um, fecal indicators and the uh, pathogen parameters. And that's for uh, total coliform. You can see there the values in two, five, and seven. Um, the others are really quite low, but we're getting up to 30,100 mils as the peak value with uh, nearly 100% non-compliance for total coliform for site five. And similar for site seven, which was the resurgent stream. E. coli, up to 15,000. Um, remember, all these are large supplies. You know, these are the comparable Havelock supply set. A bit smaller, most of them, but it's, but it's what we're dealing with. They're large commercial supplies. Entrococci, a bit lower, you'd expect from the E. coli. Uh, Clostridia, some presence of Clostridia um, in all the supplies, even the ones that are chlorinated or ozonated. Campylobacter, really quite low in most of those supplies. Uh, but uh, peaks in five and seven, and it's certainly presence of the pathogens in five and seven. Um, Cryptosporidium, um, this was done, by the way, using the same a thousand meter uh, measuring chambers that are used for the, in the water industry at that time, measuring cryptosporidium values every day in the treated water supply. And these are all, as you can see, well, most of them are treated systems. And just to go back, uh, sorry, Giardia, uh, we found Giardia again in two um, and seven uh, peaking. And just to go back to those, you get, look, get those peak concentrations in locations which are filtration uh, and UV treated. Uh, we've got it in, in, in non, in five, and that was supplying a, a farm with a dairy operation. And then with filtration and chlorination um, in, in seven. So we've, we're getting you know, really quite high levels in treated systems in the rural environment. Now the reason for that, I would hypothesize, is that we're dealing with episodic pollution, which is also carrying lots of um, basically turbidity and organics which knocks out a lot of the treatment efficacy and possibly the UV systems. But that's what we're getting in similar supplies to the, that you're having a problem with now in the UK. So it's not dissimilar to the results we're getting there. Summary um, of the supply situation, I've not finished yet, if I can just uh, take a few minutes, is um, small supplies have been have very high microbial loadings. Um, in every empirical study to date, nobody's looked at small supplies and said, these are clean. So you might feel nice and sort of comforted there, but it does suggest we've got a problem which we all share in that, that area of supply. They cause a disproportionate amount of the burden of disease. Um, something like about half, in, or 58% crown study in North America, it's about half in the UK. The half of the disease outbreaks um, are for supplies for 1% of the population, which is what these represent. Catchment control measures offer some reduction in fecal indicator loadings. The best, and I mean the best, with doing everything on catchments that we've achieved in the UK for the faecal indicators is getting the faecal indicator flux down to about 80% of what it is now. What I want to say to you very, very clearly is that that will not be enough to produce compliance in these private supplies. You've got to go much further and get log orders of reduction because the stream loadings at high flow, these episodes, are between... 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 6. So 80% is not even one log. But that's what we can achieve with the best and most intensive catchment control we can do, which is multiple interventions, stream bank fencing, wetlands, um, putting in um, stock exclusion. And that is not going to be enough. The exact impact of such measures 
um, on portable supply is probably unknown because it would be treated after the intervention um, and it may be more effective. But sanitary risk assessment is applied and recommended in Britain. But what they would say for supplies like this, the only option is to do the risk assessment but then treat the supply and make sure the treatment is more efficacious than the treatment systems I've just shown you for those treated small supplies. And I'll leave it there, Chairman, and uh, take questions. Okay, folks. <laughs>